Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So one of my favorite moments in childhood, and if I'm honest, still to this day, is going to the library. I mean, think about it. The library is kind of an amazing system where anyone from the community can go and get books and resources and, and learn knowledge for free. Assuming that you turn your stuff back in on time, which some people aren't that good at. But it, it's an amazing system. You, you check something out for a little bit, and then you take it back, and someone else gets to enjoy it, and you get to pick something else out. It's an amazing system, as long as you know that's how it works. I'm reminded of when my son figured out how the library works. He was about two years old, and for his entire life, we had gotten him books from the library. But all he knew, or at least all he thought, was that he had a lot of books. He didn't realize that they were being swapped in and out from the library until one day I told him, hey buddy, we're going to the library, and I started taking his books and putting them in the library bag. So he runs over, grabs one of his favorites out, and goes, but that's mine! That's mine. You see, he didn't understand that we were just borrowing it. It actually belonged to the library. Now, he didn't like the system, but I think he understood it because the next time I told him we're going to the library, he started grabbing books, toys, anything that was around him so that I wouldn't take it back to the library, even though none of those things actually were going back. So I wonder how often we act like that in our lives where we try to hold everything that we have, all of our stuff, so close to us because we think we're the owners. We think it's ours. Because at the end of the day, we, we want to be the owners. We want to be able to decide what to do with our stuff. Or at the very least, if we're not the owners, we want to be able to, to ignore the owner and still get to do whatever we want. See, this isn't a new problem. Actually, in Genesis 3, in the garden, Adam and Eve were set up as caretakers, as stewards over God's creation. They weren't the owners. They were just supposed to manage and take care of that which God had entrusted to them. And yet, what do they do? Like a chapter in, they buy into the lie of the serpent, where the serpent says, you can be like God. Really, what he's saying is, don't settle for being the steward, don't settle for being the caretaker. You can be like God. You can be the owner. And the consequences of that disastrous crisis of stewardship have been impacting us ever since. See, still to this day, we want to be the owner. Even though there's a mounting pile of evidence that says we're really bad at it. In fact, we're terrible owners. I mean, think about it. When we think we own our stuff, when we get to set the rules, how often do we end up addicted to that technology that we just had to have? Or we become so focused on getting that new car, having the best house, that we lose sight of all sorts of things that are important. We spend so much time and energy working on earning, spending, and keeping our possessions that it ends up consuming us. See, when we're the owners, oftentimes what happens is the things that we think we own actually end up owning us. See, that's the nature of any false idol. Is a false idol demands sacrifice, but is never satisfied. And so we can never quite have enough possessions. We can never have enough a uh, new whatever it is, because the instant that car is driven off the lot, it loses a couple thousand dollars in value, so it's not really new anymore. That piece of technology that we thought we couldn't live without, apparently what we really meant is I couldn't live without the thing that replaces it. And then I get that thing and I realize, well, that's not quite as good as I thought, and we just live in this cycle of constantly being unsatisfied. John D. Rockefeller, who's the, our, our nation's first billionaire, Still to this day, uh, he's considered the, the richest person in modern history. 
he was asked once, how much money is enough? And his answer was just a little bit more. That's the nature of life when we're the owners. The things that we think we own end up owning us. And so God wants to set us free from this system, from this idea of us as the owners. And so the kingdom that he has ushered in through his son, Jesus Christ, operates differently. Let's listen again to the beginning of our parable from Matthew 25. For the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. This is a kingdom of God parable. So primarily, it's not teaching us about investment advice or what to do with our finances, but it's teaching us about the kingdom of God. And since it's a parable, we have to kind of connect what the parable is talking about to what it actually means. And so the master in the parable is Jesus. And the servants are are believers, are his disciples. And the talents that he gives them are the things that God has entrusted to his followers, to his disciples. What Jesus is telling his disciples is that in the reign of God, they are not the owners. God is. That's the first thing we have to be clear about this morning. God is the owner which means you and I are not. And God isn't just the owner of a few things. He's the owner of everything. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell therein. Paul writes in Romans eleven thirty six, For from him, to him, and through him, are all things. What Scripture says here isn't from Him, to Him, and through Him are a few things, 10% of my things, but no more. Whatever I want to give, whatever I think I can live without, it says all things. God is the owner of all things. We are not. But this is good news because it actually frees us because he is a much better owner than we are. So where does this leave us? If we're not the owners, what are we? Well, we're meant to be like Adam and Eve, like the servants in our parable. We're meant to be stewards, caretakers, servants of the gifts of our Lord and Master. Because this generous Lord entrusts some of his possessions to his servants. But God's servants need to remember that they are not the owner of these things. They're to manage them wisely and faithfully in accordance with the desires of the master. He is the owner. And we are stewards. But we don't like this. We constantly want to fight against this. Because deep down, I don't want God to be the owner. I don't want Him to tell me what to do with my money, my time, my relationships. I still want it to be mine. This temptation of trying to take over ownership. It's the same temptation that Adam and Eve fell into in the garden. It's the same temptation that defined the life of the wicked servant from our parable. I mean, the servant's issue wasn't only that he failed to earn interest for the master, but more so that he rejected the authority of the owner. Because this parable and the kingdom of God are not about quantity. How much more do I need to gain? How faithful do I have to be? These aren't the right questions in God's kingdom because remember the master didn't give the talents to the servants based on who was his favorite he gave to the servants the text says to each according to his ability 
And notice the praise for the servant with five talents and the praise for the servant with two talents is the exact same. See, it's not about quantity. It's not about amount in the kingdom of God. What it's about is faithfulness. See, the wicked servant's issue has nothing to do with the fact that he was given less than the other two servants. The problem isn't even that he did less than the other servants. The problem is that he did nothing. In no way did he live like he had been entrusted by the master according to his ability. It's not about the amount. It's about whether the servants were faithful. See, the wicked servant, his life was saying, that's mine. If not with his words, certainly with his actions and with his attitude towards the master. Notice, when he's called to account for his actions, his excuses sound a whole lot like Adam from Genesis 3. God, it's your fault, not mine. See, the other servants acknowledge right away, Master, this is what you have entrusted to me or given to me. And the wicked servant does no such thing. He doesn't acknowledge his responsibility at all. I mean, other than digging a hole and hiding his master's money, he does nothing for the master. He does no work for him. And so what was he spending all his time and effort doing while the master was away? Apparently not spending any of it for the master, so probably all for himself. See, the wicked servant in Matthew 25, his life was defined, or more aptly consumed, by his idea that he was the owner. That's mine, ended up controlling his life. See, when it comes to the kingdom of God, that's mine is not supposed to be about your relationship with your possessions, but about God's relationship with you. See, in order to learn about the kingdom of heaven, we need to look not at the servants and their faithfulness or lack thereof. We need to look at the master. Because when we do that, we return back to the, that's mine, but from a parent's perspective, not a child's. See, anyone that's a parent understands this scenario. You're in a room that's full of kids and other parents, and all of a sudden you hear a child crying. The first thing that every parent does is you listen and you see if that crying child is yours. Because if it's not, you're off the hook. You don't really have to do anything. It's someone else's responsibility, hopefully at least. But if you hear that cry and you recognize it, what every parent does is they say, that's mine. That's my child. And they go and they comfort and they take care of their child. See, that's how God views you. Every cry in our life ultimately comes back to this idea of that's mine. And so when we're crying out in frustration over our possessions, over our income because we don't have enough or we lost something or we don't seem to have what we think we deserve, It's a cry that says, that's mine. I deserve more. God hears those cries of frustration. Our cries of grief and loss, our cries of that's mine over someone that we've lost, that's my child, that's my spouse, that's my friend. Our cries of guilt over our sin, cries of that's mine over the brokenness in our lives. That's my sin. That's my mess. That's my broken life. And we don't know what to do about it. No matter your cry, God hears it. And he recognizes it. And he answers, that's mine. That's my child. 
and then he comes to you, he takes care of you, and he gives you what you need. See, this is what happens in baptism. We had a baptism last night at our 6 o'clock service. So Callan Bartos was brought into the family of God. When you were baptized, this is what happened to you. And if you haven't been baptized yet, this is God's desire for you. Because in baptism, you are brought into the family of God. The baptismal banner that I was given uh, when I was baptized as an infant had the words of Isaiah 43, 1 on it. Fear not, I have redeemed you, God says. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. That's what God does in baptism. He says to you, and he continues to say to you each and every day, you are mine. See, God hears your cries. He says, that's mine. That's my child. And so he hears your cries of frustration over your possessions and your income. He says, that's my child. And he reminds you that he will take care of you because he's the owner. You are not. He hears your cries of guilt over your sin. And he washes them away in the waters of baptism through the death and the resurrection of Christ, which is for you. God hears your cries of grief over loss. And he gives you hope and comfort in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. No matter your cry, God hears you and he responds, you are mine. See, that's mine is not meant to be about your relationship with your possessions, but about God's relationship with you. And so we respond to this grace. We respond to being called children of the Heavenly Father. We respond by being just like the faithful servants in our parable. These servants knew they had been entrusted, they had been called, they had been taken care of by their master. And so they lived lives of a faithful response with the generosity their master had entrusted them with. See, we can find joy in the ownership of the master. We can find joy in the fact that God is the owner and not us. See, instead of saying, God, how dare you tell me what to do with my time, my money, my relationships, we can faithfully say, it's not mine. God, it's all yours. So what do you want me to do with it? Do you see how freeing that is? How freeing it is to not be in charge, to not be responsible for it, to not be our stuff? See, now we're free to be thankful for everything that God has given us. Instead of holding it on tightly, wishing we had more, we can be thankful for all that God has blessed us with. Instead of holding on to it for ourselves, we're now free to be generous. Because really, we're not giving away our stuff, we're giving away God's. And for some reason, it's way more fun to give away other people's stuff. We're free to be generous with all that God has given us because that's what he's called us to do. And we're free to be faithful. To wisely use everything that God has entrusted us with. So that other people may know the love of a God who calls you by name and says you are mine. Now that my son's a couple years older, I think he understands the library a little bit better. And he's really okay with the fact that we, we get to borrow stuff, we get to enjoy it, take care of it, and then we give it back for someone else to enjoy. See, we don't need to own everything. Actually, life's better that way. I pray that God would give us that perspective on our lives. That we would know that life is better when God is the owner, not us. That we would look at everything that he has given us. And we'd say, Lord, it's all yours. Help us to be faithful 
with everything you've blessed us with. In the name of the one who calls you by name, who says, you are mine. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until the day he calls you home. Amen.